Welcome to Science or Not. I am Oblivious Elsk, the crazy person wearing the Quiznos napkin hat. Why? I have no idea. I'm not getting sponsored. But forget the illogical craziness. Let's go on to the logical craziness, as if there were such a thing. Mainly the science craziness, which I happen to adore. The first craziness that I want to talk about today is the abundance of tornadoes that we've had lately. I have been in Eugene, Oregon, and there have been no such tornadoes here. Also in Texas, where I normally film this show, specifically Houston, is not known for its tornadoes either. However, there have been multitudes of tornado sightings and people in the central states getting plowed over by these things. And more so this year than usual. And there are multiple reasons as to why this is. Three big reasons, two of them being purely scientific and the third one being kind of funny. The first one is that La Nina, a weather effect that I talked about a few episodes ago, I will include the link right on the cat there, has once again gone away. La Nina is specifically a cyclical system of trade winds that cools the waters of the equatorial Pacific Ocean. Try saying that five times fast. So what does trade winds have anything to do with tornadoes? When La Nina is around, this air current pushes the main jet stream higher up. However, when La Nina is not there, this jet stream or high-speed air current comes down, and it creates kind of a bump in between cool, dry air and warm, moist air. When this happens, you get storms. When you get storms in the right situations, you get tornadoes. Second reason is because last winter was pretty cold, and cold for a long time, too. There were record snowfalls and snowpacks have kept northern air especially cold. I'm not a big meteorologist, so I can't briefly explain why exactly this has anything to do with tornadoes, but it's probably the same thing as La Nina. Get two different air currents, smack together, you get storms. And the third reason, which is the main reason why I'm actually mentioning all of this stuff. There are just more of us to see them. Just because we've seen more tornadoes doesn't mean that there are overall more. It's a similar deal with the tree in the forest with no one there to hear it. Did the tornado really happen if no one reported it? Well, obviously you could argue the point that, yeah, a tornado happened if it destroyed some stuff. But now we have more stuff. So now we know that there are even more tornadoes because it's hit a barn or a house or a cow. There's a reference to the movie Twister if you've ever seen it. Cow! Moo! Another cow! Moo! No, I think that was the same cow. Did I just call myself a cow? Anyway. A long time ago when there were less people in the country and it was more sparsely populated, and of course when less people had access to a cell phone or a camera, there were simply fewer reports of tornadoes. According to this year's preliminary count of the month of April, there were 875 tornadoes that occurred, which is a huge number. The highest number of tornadoes on record for any month is 542, from May of 2003. But that's not to say that there haven't been that many tornadoes in existence in one month before. The combination of more people to see them and this weird weather occurrence happening just created a whole bunch of tornadoes, and we're actually there to see them. New subject! Next interesting cool science fact thingy! There have been multitudes of new species discovered in the recent years. But what are the top ten? I know I'm not going to number them, you can number them yourself, but in no particular order, here are the top ten newly discovered species. Number one, the T-Rex leech, which has enormous teeth despite its two-inch body. And no, it has nothing to do with the T-Rex, it was just named the Tyrannodella rex, which means Tyrant Leech King. Almost sounds like something out of a video game like Zelda or Dead Space. Number two, Titanic bacteria, which I mentioned in a previous show. Cat holding the link again. And this bacteria is actually theorized to be a great agent to use in natural disintegration of large sunken iron structures, like oil rigs no longer being used, or shipwrecks that we want to get rid of. Number three, one of my favorite, the pancake batfish, which moves awkwardly through the water kind of like a walking bat, or a walking pancake, or both. Number four, a glowing fungus which has a luminescent gel that coats them and shines constantly, 24-7. Number five, Leap roaches, or otherwise known as jumping cockroaches, as if they weren't gross enough. These leap roaches have hind legs that resemble grasshoppers. But these little guys make a pretty important discovery, because the only other jumping cockroaches were discovered to be from the late Jurassic. I guess they've been here all this time and we never really noticed them. Either that or they re-evolved after they went extinct all the way back then. Number six, a new species of monitor lizard, which isn't all too special, but it looks pretty cool. It's got a black slash blue overall color and has yellow spots. Number seven, and I'm getting tired of holding my fingers up, Walter's Dwinker, or simply put, a new kind of antelope. Unfortunately, this antelope was discovered dead, but oddly discovered in a bushmeat market in Africa. Number eight, the raspy cricket, which is now the only known pollinator of an extremely rare orchid in the Massacreen Islands. Number nine, 
a gilled mushroom found underwater in the Rogue River in Oregon. And this mushroom is special because it was actually observed fruiting for 11 weeks underwater the entire time. And last but not least, number 10, a giant golden orb weaver, specifically named Darwin's bark spider whose webs are more than twice as strong as any other known spider silk. And if you had a piece of Kevlar the same size, this web is actually 10 times stronger. This allows this crazy spider to form webs that span rivers, streams, or even crazier lakes. One specific web was actually measured at 82 feet long across a Madagascar river, and it had at least 30 insects trapped in it. So those were the top 10. Which one's your favorite? Mine's the spider, because I just think that spider's freaking cool. New subject. Hey, what was that? Bring that picture back. What the heck? How does that happen? I have no idea. The place I found it has no idea, so feel free to speculate. But the link where I found it will be down below so you can theorize away. But anyway, I randomly came across this picture and I thought I'd throw it in. Okay, let's switch off of organisms and go to some more crazy environmental science. Italian seismologists are being tried for manslaughter of the people who died in, in the 2009 L'Aquila quake. What? No, stop being stupid. Oh, you're serious. To someone who's buried himself in the realm of science, this is such an absurd story. I have no idea what to think of it. Predicting earthquakes is such a faulty profession that how on earth are you going to charge someone of the crime of not predicting an earthquake? The logic of this situation is that this team of seismologists knew about some tremors but didn't alert the public to them. Basically, that a couple of small earthquakes came right before the big one that presumably could have tipped them to get the people out of there. The truth is that there were a whole bunch of small earthquakes weeks, even months before the big one. So unless you want to cry wolf lots of times just to be safe, stop blaming people for inexact science. And if you want to blame them, you give it a try. You try predicting an earthquake. Line from the movie The Oxford Murders comes to mind. On the matter of the chaos theory with a butterfly causing a hurricane, Google it if you don't know what I'm talking about, in the words of John Hurt, The butterfly that flutters his wings and causes a hurricane on the other side of the world. We've been hearing about that damn butterfly for decades, but who has been able to predict a single hurricane? Nobody! Now, meteorology is not as inexact as predicting earthquakes, but hurricanes is a whole other big deal. But as for the earthquake, the Laquila fault that caused this earthquake is so unconventional, with a whole bunch of faults going every which way, that frankly, I'd be completely surprised if they could actually have predicted that earthquake. New subject. For a while now, there's been a mystery about the universe, namely that we don't know where some of the mass went. I have no idea how they tested this kind of stuff, but let's just go with them on this. Apparently, there was more mass that existed within the universe when it started than it has today. As stated by the Law of Conservation of Mass, mass will remain constant over time. Or, similarly stated in the high school version, matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So for a while now, we've been looking for this missing mass. Oh, the universe? Oh, I just put it over there. Hey, where's my universe? Who stole my universe? And thanks to an Australian university student, we've found it. Ah, universe, we are together again. For some reason, the universe is a pillow. Apparently it resides in what are called filaments of galaxies, which are huge structures in the universe that are thread-like organizations of gravitationally bound galaxies. These galaxy filaments seem to have the missing matter at low densities and very high temperatures within them. If you're not an astrophysicist or an astrologist, this subject probably has no merit to you over being sheer trivial knowledge. But here's an interesting fact. Some of the technology in cell phones originally stemmed from a line of research that was focusing on black holes. So eventually this research could be meaningful to your normal person. As for how meaningful, you never can tell, but that's why we do research. And to stem off of that, I discovered something that came out just today, that the World Health Organization has now listed mobile phone use in the same carcinogenic hazard category as lead, engine exhaust, and chloroform. A team of a whole bunch of scientists in a whole bunch of countries looked over a whole bunch of data and have concluded that cell phones can cause cancer. The type of radiation coming out of a cell phone is called non-ionizing. It's kind of like an x-ray, but not quite. It's kind of like a really low-powered microwave oven. Oven? Yeah, I can speak English. Kind of like a really low-powered microwave oven. So in essence, if you talk long enough, you're microwaving your own brain. But I don't really want to talk too much about this or worry too much about it at all. There's been so many bouncing theories saying cell phone causes cancer, cell phone doesn't cause cancer, cell phone causes cancer, cell phone doesn't cause cancer. Okay, they're vital to today's society, let's stop worrying about them. 
I don't use my cell phone to communicate for that long at all, really. That's what I use my computer for. And just watch, next month they'll be saying cell phones are okay again. But take a look at the article linked down below and make your own conclusions. This has been Science or Not. Thank you for watching. I've included all the stories that I talked about today in the links below. And if you haven't had your fill of science from the stories that I talked about, I'm including one that I didn't talk about. It's basically Stephen Hawking's outlook on what happens after death calls it a fairy story. So if you're religious or even not religious, get a kick out of it. If you liked the show, click the like button. And if you really liked the show and would like to see more, click the subscribe button. And you'll see my lovely face show up on the YouTube main page next time I post a video. This will be my last episode in Oregon, so say goodbye to the cat. Bye-bye. But I will see you next time.